that my hand that my hand given to a master mason given to a master mason shall be a sure pledge of brotherhood shall be a this is a reconstruction of freemasonry's strongest oath of brotherhood the so-called five points of fellowship it is this secretly sworn vow which most worries the critics of freemasonry to unite with his informing a column of mutual defense and support a column of mutual defense and support. There's no question that you can create a kind of bonding out of which comes a loyalty and obedience in which the person just doesn't think for themselves or doesn't behave as they would if you got them on their own, away from this influence. They have an oath of loyalty one to another uh, to protect brother Freemasons. My own experience as a result of what has happened to me in the last uh, six and a half years is that Freemasonry is an exclusive and secretive subculture of self-interest within the police service and within all bodies in, in which it, it takes root. There is continuing concern over the power and secret dealings of Freemasons in political and public service institutions like local government and the police. It's not just non-Masons who are worried. At the Brotherhood's grassroots, many Master Masons are deeply disturbed by evidence of corruption and the abuse of patronage by wayward brethren. They believe it's time Grand Lodge put its house in order. The men at the top uh, are, are either so naive they think it doesn't exist or they're turning a blind eye to it because there is smoke and we've got to put out the fire. And the vet wouldn't believe that we'd take him. That is a record. Look at him. Fit as a fiddle. Leonard Acklam, a retired engineer from Brighouse in Yorkshire, has been a devoted mason for over 30 years. But he's become increasingly disillusioned with the Brotherhood and now believes senior masons are prepared to abuse their authority and cover up for each other. He's especially worried about the case of an ex-London policeman, Brian Woolard, who alleges that Freemasons have destroyed his career. I think that Mr Woolard, should be given a full investigation as to the allegation. If he's wrong, he must stand the consequences. But if he's right, then the Masonic order must stand the consequences. There's a right and a wrong. And the public is entitled to know who is right and who is wrong. In 1981, Chief Inspector Brian Woolard came up against Freemasonry when he was investigating fraud involving hundreds of thousands of pounds of ratepayers' money in the London borough of Islington. Tales had been circulating that officers in the building works department were authorizing unjustified payments to private building companies in exchange for bribes. The rumors that uh, flew around at the time suggested things like holidays abroad, uh, gifts, uh, valuable gifts, money changing hands, um, extensive, excessive hospitality in West End nightclubs, these sorts of things. At 123 Sussex Way, the borough had paid £2,300 for a new roof. But when the council auditors checked, they discovered that contractors hadn't done the work. Here at 53 Kingsdown Road, two separate firms of builders were both paid for the same renovation job, while at 25 Landseer Road, builders were paid four times as much as the original contract price. The Evening Standard exposed the scandal, and Islington called in the fraud squad. But the police inquiry made little progress until nine months later when Chief Inspector Woolard took over. He received a tip-off that a contractor getting a lot of work from Islington and a senior council officer handing out the contracts were Masonic brothers in the same lodge. The Masonic element of the inquiry and the connections between uh, officials and others uh, in that inquiry uh, was something that was relatively new. But as soon as Woolard began to probe Masonic connections between the suspects, his inquiries attracted unexpected attention. Within a short time, telephone calls were received at my office. One from the principal contractor who was under suspicion, and another from an official at the Director of Public Prosecution's office. The DPP official was no less than Assistant Deputy Director Richard Thomas. As Woolard had never heard from any public prosecution official before this, he thought it most odd that he should hear from one now. Woolard suspected Thomas was a Mason, 
and that his phone call had been prompted by one of the Masons already under suspicion. It wasn't just the fact that he telephoned me, it was the timing of his telephone calls. It was so soon after I'd interviewed a senior official who was a Freemason, whose uh, deputy within the local authority had done a bunk. He'd taken immediate leave of absence. Uh, th there were certain moves taking place uh, within that local authority, uh, suggestive of trying to cover things up. Woolard was in a dilemma, especially now he was told that two of his fraud squad bosses were also Freemasons and in the same lodge as two of the council suspects. So instead of asking permission to question the DPP man, he ignored normal procedures and confronted Richard Thomas without seeking higher authority. My main concern was what prompted him to telephone me. And at the end of the interview, he said that he may have received a phone call from outside, which caused him uh, to ring me uh, at that particular time. And this is what I suspected all along. Woolard promptly reported to Scotland Yard and then to the Fraud Squad headquarters that he had just interviewed the DPP official. Within hours, he was removed from the Islington Inquiry on the grounds that he had ignored the chain of command. Many observers believe there were other reasons for his removal. There's no doubt that Brian Woolard's first troubles arose through Masonic interference in his investigation. He was looking at corruption in a London Borough Council. Uh, he found evidence, and I'm convinced he found evidence, that contracts were being awarded on a Masonic basis. When he bought this, or when he tried to investigate this, he was taken off the inquiry. Without Woolard, the fraud squad failed to find any evidence connecting Freemasonry with corruption at Islington Council. In due course, the Islington Inquiry report came back from the DPP's office and was marked no further action. But further action would be taken against Brian Woolard. I seem to have become overnight a non-person. I was stuck in an office where I, I, I spent five weeks reading library books. Eventually, I was summoned to the office of a Deputy Assistant Commissioner, Ronald Steventon, whom I subsequently discovered was a Freemason. He told me that uh, I was not a fit person to be employed in a specialist department in plain clothes, and that I was going to be transferred uh, to the uniform branch. I asked him if anybody had made any complaint, and he said that I had caused embarrassment. Woolard was posted to Wembley Police Station as a uniform chief inspector. Until his standover Islington, he'd been regarded as a high flyer. He'd served for 22 years in plain clothes and had been a special branch officer on royal protection duties at Buckingham Palace, guarding cabinet ministers and gaining glowing testimonials when he later joined the anti-terrorist squad and the CID. But his first annual report at Wembley catalogued a startling decline. He is completely unsuited to this very responsible post. He has no incentive, and I consider it very unlikely that he will make any greater efforts. All my reports since 1982 have been by senior officers who are Freemasons. And the first two were so scurrilous, I have never seen the like of them given to any police officer in my entire police service. So from one moment when I was considered to be a high flyer and a good officer, and the next day, I was a non-person and a police officer who had not the wit to hold down his job even. Early in 1984, a few details of Woolard's case surfaced in Private Eye and The Observer, and he was wrapped over the knuckles for speaking to the press. But the stories revived fears about Masonry's disproportionate strength among Britain's police forces. Eventually, Metropolitan Commissioner Sir Kenneth Newman was forced to intervene in the growing row. In 1985, he compiled a booklet, The Principles of Policing, for distribution to every one of London's 28,000 police officers. It laid down guidelines on the role of the police in the community, but in a long section on Freemasonry, the advice was pointed. The discerning officer would probably consider it wise to forego the prospect of pleasure and social advantage in Freemasonry, so as to enjoy the unreserved regard of all those around him. As far as the principles of policing are concerned, the book, the idea was very, very sound, and still is sound. But that particular chapter, uh, that picks on Freemasonry, I thought was unfair. A, it wasn't discussed properly, and at length, 
and B, it singled out one organisation that has proved itself time and time again to be an excellent organisation with all good intentions that all citizens should aim for. Although the booklet carried all the authority of London's chief policeman, Commissioner Newman's advice was not compulsory. Indeed, a few months later, many high-ranking officers chose to flout it. In 1986, a new all-police lodge was formed, in itself proof of Freemasonry's remarkable strength in the Metropolitan Force. Lodges restricted to one job or profession are not normally allowed in Freemasonry. Yet the founder members of the new Manor of St. James's Lodge were almost all past and present policemen and included some of Scotland Yard's highest ranking officers. The former chief of all London's 3,000 detectives, Gilbert Kellen. The then commander of the fraud branch, Malcolm Campbell. And one time deputy assistant commissioner, Peter Nevens. Well, the, the founders were faced with a very difficult situation because, in fact, they were putting this lodge together before the publication of the principles of policing. And they were faced with a difficult uh, problem. Uh, do they now ab abandon the idea and be seen uh, to be cowards in, uh, in the face of what might have been opposition? The principles of policing could be seen as a threat to the power of Freemasonry in the police force but it may also have been seen as a challenge to the very power of Freemasonry itself. Certainly, the consecration of the Manor of St. James Lodge, which took place here in Freemasons Hall, was not only sanctioned by Grand Lodge, but actively blessed by the presence of some of the craft's highest officers, including Grand Secretary Commander Hyam. The danger in a large single profession lodge like the Manor of St. James is that it could bond together senior and influential figures working within a single public body, in this case the Metropolitan Police, all pledged to mutual support. The grip or token is the first of the five points of fellowship. They are hand to hand, foot to foot, knee to knee, breast to breast, and hand over back. I may thus be briefly explained. Hand to hand, I greet you as a brother. Foot to foot, I support you in all your laudable undertakings. Knee to knee, the posture of my daily supplications shall remind me of your wants. Breast to breast, your lawful secrets when entrusted to me as such, I will keep as my own. Hand over back, I will support your character in your absence as in your presence. It is in this position... The thought of public figures like policemen, judges and even cabinet ministers undergoing rituals like this strikes many people as bizarre. For others like Brian Woolard, it is sinister. But Freemasons see it differently. Uh, it's a form of symbolism. They're all symbolic and... and uh, to us, they are uh, important in, in the sense that uh, you, uh, are you, you do what you do um, are in the group of people that you can trust and that you respect, and they in turn respect you. But ultimately, it's not the secrecy or symbolism in Freemasonry's rituals which is important. It's the secrecy of so much of its membership. A lot of Masons make no secret about their... Uh, allegiances. Uh, they call themselves Knife and Fork Masons because they go along for the social life. But unfortunately there are a group, and it must be a substantial group, who are unwilling to reveal their identity, who are in positions of power, and who, whether they use their influence or not, must arouse the suspicion in the public mind that anything that they get involved in is not dealt with correctly. Just occasionally that secrecy is breached and Masonic documents come to light. Five years after Brian Woolard had been banished to Wembley, a well-wisher sent him a Manor of St. James Lodge membership list, which had been left in a squad car in a West End police station. When I read the Manor of St. James Lodge list, I was so surprised to see so many officers who had had some influence over my career, all in the same lodge. I mean, to find one or two uh, might have, have been uh, suggestive that it was a coincidence, but to find so many, one after another. The list revealed that Manor Masons were especially thick on the ground at Wembley. 
they included three founders of the lodge, the commander of Kew District, which included Wembley, William Gibson, his deputy, Chief Superintendent Ben Pountain, and Edgar Maybanks, Kew District's Deputy Assistant Commissioner. I was in a sort of Masonic soup bowl, if you like, and I couldn't get out of it. There was no way out because any complaint I made would have to go through the chain of command. So the very officers against whom I was complaining would somehow make decisions relating to any report that I submitted and would put whatever comments they chose on those reports. One of those officers was co-founder of the Manor of St. James Lodge, Commander Gibson. Woolard was the chief inspector under my command for some time, so I know the circumstances uh, as well as anyone, if not better, and I've got no sympathy with Woolard and his views whatsoever. Uh, he's a very articulate, possible gentleman. I cannot see that there is any credible evidence to support an allegation that Freemasonry has banded together to form a conspiracy against the individual. Whatever these officers were doing, they were doing as police officers, not as Freemasons. The Manor Lodge list might not convince Masonic policemen of the need for an inquiry, but many non-Masons find it persuasive evidence in support of Brian Woolard's claim that his career has been wrecked by Masons in the Metropolitan Police. Among those who believe his case should be investigated is Labour MP Austin Mitchell. What irks me is the fact that there's no way of taking it up. We've taken this, first of all, to the uh, Commission of the Metropolitan Police, from him to the Home Secretary, uh, in each case it's been referred back down to the people against whom complaint is being made in the first place. Uh, and there's no way of getting an independent review of this, uh, of this matter. England's Masonic chiefs have taken the view that Woolard's claims are without substance. But Freemason Leonard Acklam is unconvinced by head office denials. He read of Woolard's case in the national press. And although he was concerned about the damage it was doing to Freemasonry, he was not prepared to see it swept under the Masonic carpet. Now, Mr. Woolard has got sacked. To the best of my knowledge, no investigation has ever been taking place. Here is a man who has got promoted, one must presume, by his own initiative and his own efforts and his dedication to the job. And he rises to a very high rank in the Metropolitan Police and all of a sudden he's a poor policeman. I just don't believe it. I cannot believe it. In 1988, Scotland Yard dismissed Brian Woolard for going absent without leave. In fact, he had medical backing for not going to work unless he was assured that he would not be serving under a Masonic boss. But although his career is finished, Brian Woolard hasn't given up. Eight years after he was taken off the Islington Inquiry, he's still fighting to get what he has sought for so long, a High Court review of his case or a hearing for wrongful dismissal. I believe that my case will show, when it's examined dispassionately in a court of law, that there are influences there which can interfere with adequate redress. There are influences there which can lead to the destruction of an officer's career. There are influences there which can hinder the proper investigation of offences. And if those influences are shown to be active within the police force still, then I think that is a very, very serious matter indeed. The Masonic dimensions to Brian Woolard's story have become clear only through his professional persistence and the carelessness of St. James Freemasons leaving lodge lists in police cars. In most of the cases we've investigated in this series, it's largely through chance that Freemasonry's role has emerged at all. How many Masonic groups in other walks of life are still unknown because the relevant lodge lists remain secret. Recently, non-Masons in politics, the civil service and local government have demanded that Masons should declare their membership of the Brotherhood. After a recent Masonic scandal in South End, a then conservative councillor, Chris Hudson, called for a register of all Masonic councillors, but the motion was voted down. That in itself is not bad, but the people who voted against it being carried through were possibly themselves Masons. So therefore we had people sitting in judgment on themselves. So unless we have a declaration, of who are Masons, we're never going to be able to see the picture developed. We've just got a, a hazy negative of what's going on. 
In Rochford, Essex, there was uproar when opposition councillors recently named members of the ruling Conservative group as Freemasons. Why did most of the Masons refuse to declare themselves? That is essentially up to, member, up to other members of the Rochford Council, whether or not they declare their Freemasonry. I think that many of them feel that I, exactly what I do, that it was an impertinence to ask them to do this. Next thing we shall be asked is how many times a week we beat our wife. In Derbyshire, declaration of Masonic membership became an issue after the truth leaked out about the power wielded by local Freemasons. For more than 30 years, they've held some of the most influential jobs in county government. Since 1987, county council employees have been required to declare whether they are Freemasons, a reform introduced by the ruling Labour group. I don't want to come across here as being someone sort of anti-Masonry, because I'm not. What I'm anti is their influence. If people want to gather together and do those things, I think that's entirely a matter for them. But I would think it's in their interest to be turned around and say, look, let's throw open our meetings. Let's go the way that most public organisations are going and saying, OK, let people come in who are observers. Let the TV cameras go into one of their meetings and see these rituals and take that secrecy away of it because I'm sure there are many people who want to be in the Masons, they enjoy it, they've got a contribution to make, they like to do good charity work and are probably offended by some of the uh, comments that are made elsewhere. The answer is open the doors. In recent years the Grand Lodge of England has opened its doors but has rejected demands that it should publish its membership lists. Most Masons argue that compulsory declaration of their membership would be an infringement of their civil liberties, a witch hunt. There's no reason to conceal it very much from anybody, but where are you going to draw the line? I mean, I don't think any of us have the least hesitation in, if we're asked in a relevant context of, of saying, yes, we are. We're not on the defensive. It's not an admission. We're proud of it. But I do query the sense of the public trying to pick on one group and say, now you've got to declare. It's, uh, it's a strange, it's not a very attractive approach of one half of the community to another. It may not be attractive, but most of the 200 MPs who responded to a recent survey believe that politicians and other public office holders should declare their Masonic ties. We have to declare, for instance, uh, uh, whether we're company directors, uh, whether we're directors of this dodgy building company or, or that uh, failing uh, travel company or this consultancy or whatever, uh, why shouldn't we have to declare something else which can also influence our behaviour? And that should go for, uh, it should go for judges, it should go for council uh, officials, it should go for people in a position of trust and responsibility, and that includes senior policemen. I'm not against Freemasonry. I'm all in favour of harmless. Uh, uh, activities uh, l like that and nobody would want to stop people belonging but uh, those who belong should have the courage of their rather blood-curdling convictions uh, and, and declare it. Public declaration could even help Freemasonry. Remove the secrecy of membership and the possibility of Masonic corruption would be reduced. Once a year the Masons of Melrose in Scotland march through the town square so every member of the Lodge is known to all the townspeople. Perhaps the rest of Britain's Masons should come out of their closets and march openly through the streets, if they've nothing to hide.